it's the wonderful time of year again, a time of joy for children, for memories for adults, and a special thanksgiving by all Christians throughout the world, for we are now in the Christmas season. Tonight, let's take a romantic look at our city, at Austin as seen through the eyes of old and new history. We'll take our tour of the legends of Austin in just a moment. Tonight, the third in the series of programs, Progress Report Austin, The Legends of Austin. This series is brought to you each month by the Austin National Bank, now at 517 Congress Avenue, while the new bank building is under construction. In just a moment, Progress Report Austin presents The Legends of Austin. Good evening. Tonight, our progress report, Austin, concerns the legends of Austin. Bonner, where does our story begin? Jim, it could begin almost anywhere. There are many legends about our town, such as the one about the supposed caves under Austin. But actually, our title is a little misleading. A legend is a romantic or non-historical story, a myth or a fable. Mount Bunnell is supposed to have the most beautiful view of Austin. But there was a time, or so legend has it, when a lovely Spanish girl met her death here. Supposedly, she was rescued from Comanche Indians by her sweetheart. The Indians pursued the young lovers and overtook them on the mountain top. The brave Spanish nobleman was killed, and the Spanish beauty sprang from the precipice rather than return to a Comanche teepee. And so today on Mount Bunnell, legend has it, Bright blue flowers bloom every spring on the spot where she stood and from whence she leaped to her death. Another of the legends of Austin that we can safely put in the fiction group is the one about Barton Springs. The loveliness of Barton's has thrilled Texans for many, many years now. And once upon a time, on the rocky ledge across from the present bathhouse, a rainbow rested. This is the story as told by early Indians. It was a beautiful rainbow, but the lightning in the sky was jealous. And so one day, the jealous lightning threw a bolt at the rainbow. And from the resulting crevices poured the cold spring waters, which Austinites have enjoyed since 1837. It was in that year of 1837 that William Barton settled at the springs, and his two daughters, Parthenia and Eliza, began the tradition of bathing beauties parading the grassy banks of Barton's, a tradition you'll find flowering each spring when the sun returns the warmth to the ground. The man for whom Austin is named Stephen F. Austin was an unusual leader, but he had nothing whatever to do with the city being chosen as the state capital. However, back in the 1826 on Baylor here in Austin, and chose 11 leagues along the Colorado as the site for a future university. But our story now is about Austin's old history. Actually, back in 1838, there was a log cabin where the Congress Avenue Bridge stands now. It belonged to a man named Jacob Harrell. Mirabeau B. Lamar came to hunt with Harold and looking over the Colorado River Valley said this, here shall be the seat of our future empire. A settlement was already here then called Waterloo. But the first settler in Travis County is reputed to be Reuben Hornsby, who landed with Stephen Austin at the mouth of the Brazos River on February the 5th, 1830. In that same year, he surveyed the area now known to us as Hornsby Bend. This marker is on the Weberville Road. It was in July of 1832 that he and his family established their home in Travis County. And in this graveyard at Hornsby Cemetery, you will find the graves of two men killed by Indians. 
or the early days here were filled with Indian battles just as much as in the rest of the West. This monument to Josiah Pugh Wilbarger of Austin's Colony tells the story of his scalping by Indians in 1833 while locating lands for the colonists. But he lived on until 1845. Months after Lamar's hunting trip, Austin was selected as the capital of the young republic. A native Virginian, Edwin Waller, was commissioned to lay out the town site, construct the necessary government buildings, and sell lots at a public auction. The first capital stood at the corner of what is now West 8th and Colorado Streets, and it was replaced by this old city hall after it burned down. The president's mansion stood where there is now a downtown parking lot. And in October of 1839, only the Capitol and the White House were painted when Lamar, now the president of the Republic, and his cabinet moved in. 306 downtown lots had been sold at that first public auction. Austin was not yet firmly established as the capital. Sam Houston, the Raven, did not like our city. He wanted to be the capital to be in Houston, named for him, of course. When he became president in 1842, Houston vowed to abandon Austin to the Indians and to the Buffalo. And in 1843, he ordered the government to move. Austin vigilantes fought off the efforts, and one determined lady, a Mrs. Angelina Eberly, aimed a cannon from the then land office and routed a party sent by Houston to steal the archives. February 19, 1846, Texas joins the Union. Austin became the state capital, and the flag made by Joanna Troutman became only a state flag, not a flag for a republic. Never before or since in history such an event. Under no duress were their independence guaranteed by England and France the people of Texas voluntarily lowered their own flag. Anson Jones spoke this haunting valedictory as he stood watching the change of flags. The Republic of Texas is no more. But before the Republic ended, it had had its humorous moments too. Count Alphonse de Saligny, the French Charles Affaire, who had gained French recognition for the young republic by claiming a population of over one million in 1840 when we had only about 200,000. The Count built his own mansion, the French Legation, now maintained as a museum by the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. But he never lived in it. The reason? Well, the Count was living at Bullock's Hotel while the Legation was being built, and he kept his horse and carriage there, too. Now, innkeeper Bullock kept pigs, as was natural for that day and time. Those pigs dug a tunnel, ate the corn reserved for the Count's horses. In turn, the Count's groom killed the pig. Then, Mr. Bullock thrashed the groom. Count de Saligny forgot about a French empire, demanded punishment of Bullock, and when that wasn't done, left Alston vowing never to return. And he didn't. The legation, though, is still here on East 7th and San Marcos Streets. And I'll be back in a moment with more legends in the history of Austin. There are many more legends and much more history about Austin and its people, like the legendary Bigfoot Wallace, a ranger and a great hunter who sold venison from an open-air stand on West 9th Street. You know, Bigfoot almost married, but as a result of smallpox, all of his hair fell out. So Bigfoot retired to the caves west of Austin, and with the aid of bear grease, grew a new head of hair. But while he was gone, his bride-to-be had married another. Bigfoot Wallace swore off women right then, and you know, he never did marry. Steamboats once struggled up the Colorado to Austin in the 1850s, and a man named Abner Cook began building homes in Austin. One of his first contracts was for a plantation west of Austin for a John P. Shaw soon to be married. Shaw, too, was jilted, and he never occupied his home. Instead, 
Elihu Pease bought it and moved his family there after serving two terms as governor. On its spacious grounds, General George B. Custer and his Yankee soldiers organized the first baseball team in this part of Texas in 1867. Today, this gracious home has been restored and is now the home of former Governor Alan Shivers and his family. Governor Pease left another landmark in Austin, the Shady Park along Shoal Creek, a perpetual gift from him to his adopted city. Civil War came, but no destruction came to Austin. Austin, in fact, voted against secession, siding for once with Sam Houston, the governor and president it never forgave. Terry's Rangers enlisted here in Austin and fought bravely on the fields of Tennessee and Virginia. Later, all Austin turned out in defiance of Yankee bayonets to honor Albert Sidney Johnston, the Texas general killed at Shiloh. The state cemetery was laid out to honor the Confederate dead. But again, history had to have its ironic twist in the legends of Austin. Overlooking the rows of white crosses are the towering monuments to Edmund Jackson Davis, the carpetbag governor of Texas. Davis had organized a Texas regiment to fight for the North and served as governor of Texas from 1869 to 1873. He lived out his years in Austin, respected as a citizen, if hated as a governor. Susanna Dickinson, the heroine of the Alamo, found happiness here after two unhappy decades following the death of her husband in the Alamo. Ben Thompson, the gunfighter of Kansas and San Antonio, turned to being a lawman and called Austin home for nearly 30 years. Remember today for his service to Austin as a city marshal, a far call from his younger days. Another of the Austin legends is of a man who seemed more legend than real, even when the facts were told. His name, William Sidney Porter, better known to the world as O. Henry the Author. He lived in Austin, worked as a bookkeeper, and as a draftsman for the state land office. It was in the land office that he found inspiration for two of his most famous stories. He married an Austin girl, Ethel Estes, and had his own newspaper, The Rolling Stone. And it was here that he was involved in a money shortage that sent him to a federal prison. Today, the Confederate Museum honors him by displaying the drawing table he once used. The land office shows the maps he decorated. And the O'Henry Museum at 409 East 5th Street is seen by hundreds of visitors each year. Part of the history and legend of Austin is in its state capitals, for we've had several, four to be exact. The old opera house here was here during three of them. Congress Avenue looked like this in 1870. And it had changed, but only slightly, by 1872. If you'd like to know how 6th and Congress looked in 1875, this is it. And St. Martin's Lutheran Church, just north of the Capitol until very recently, looked this way in 1883. The railroad was important in the building of our state capitals, and the old railroad bridge of 1880 doesn't look quite so sturdy today. The old colonial capital looked this way. But it was destined to die, and it died by fire. So it was that new ones were being built. The last one, well, the granite came from our own granite mountain up at Marble Falls. And the new capital was dedicated May 16, 1888, in quite an event. It took five years to build, cost Texas three million acres of land. Convict labor was furnished to the contractors, and a narrow gauge railway was built at state expense. The big parade at the dedication featured live Indians and real stagecoaches. And believe us, it was the social hit of the century. These souvenirs from David Lamb's collection are truly rare today. Today, the state capital is a tourist mecca. And the goddess of liberty, being installed here in 1888, rises 308 feet into the air, overlooking 18 shady acres. In the olden days, the new governor's mansion was being built. It does look a little bit different from today. And it was improving as the years rolled along. Today, new state buildings rise in every direction, giving our capital a new look that would amaze Austin, Houston, and Lamar if they should return tomorrow morning.
we say legends are not always fiction, Elizabeth Ney is a wonderful example of the person who becomes a legend, and she did in her own day and time. She was beautiful, talented, and most unconventional, a sculptress of worldwide fame. In this German-style, castle-like home in North Austin, she found the haven she had long sought. Born in Germany in 1833, she built the first unit of her Austin studio in Hyde Park in 1892. The second unit was added 10 years later. This portrait is now being purchased by private citizens interested in the Ney Museum, and the support of its purchase is requested by the many art lovers of our area. While still in Germany, she met a young Scotsman, a medical student by the name of Edmund Montgomery, later a physician, chemist, and philosopher. Ten years later, they were married on the island of Madeira. But in keeping with the legends of Elizabeth Ney, she retained her maiden name and always referred to Dr. Montgomery as her best friend. In 1873, they moved to Texas to the Leandro Plantation near Hempstead. Her contacts with Governor Oren Roberts led her to work again in Austin. And today, in the Ney Museum at 304 East 44th, you may see many works by this unusual lady such as this Lady Macbeth in the famous sleeping scene. This is only a copy. The original marble statue is in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. This is King Ludwig II of Bavaria, the leading supporter of the arts in Germany while Miss Ney lived there. The original is in a castle close to Munich, and Miss Ney was ahead of her times in other ways, too. She kept her hair short, wore a trouser-like garment, kept her maiden name, and invaded the men's world in a day when this was considered quite unusual. Elizabeth Ney, another of the living legends of Austin. Today her studio is preserved as a museum by the Texas Fine Arts Association, and it is open to the public. This, too, is the house of a living legend, the home of a man who stayed behind the scenes. His name, Colonel Edward M. House, who built this home on West Avenue in 1883. He managed the campaign of four governors, James Hogg, C.A. Culberson, Joseph Sayers, and S.W.T. Lanham. It was his strategy that led to Woodrow Wilson's nomination for president and to Wilson's victory. His career continued through the early 30s of this century, and his death in 1938 was a quiet and peaceful one, with few people ever realizing the power this man had exerted in the councils of his state and the world. Zilker Park today is a fact, not a legend, but it too is a part of our heritage. Adolf Zilker came to Austin as a day laborer, acquired wealth, and left a heritage to all of us, for he deeded to Austin the sprawling acres south of the river, now known as Zilker Park. Today, this is known as the Brackenridge Tract, given to the university by George Washington Brackenridge. Portions of this area were in the area first chosen by Stephen F. Austin back in the 1820s for a future great university. One of the ironic twists of history and our legends, two men, decades apart, both choosing the same site for a future university. And you know, there are many legends about the university. From its beginning in 1881 with a faculty of 13 and a student body of some 200, the original campus was the traditional 40 acres. And the old main building was just that, the main building for everything. By 1898, the campus was changing slightly for the better, and in 1910, the improvement was still going on. The legends surrounding O.B. Hall are many, and there's the legend true story about how the lyrics to the eyes of Texas were first written as a satire on University President William L. Prather, who liked to end his speeches with the line, the eyes of Texas are upon you. There's the time that the university took an official holiday to bury a beloved mascot, Pig Belmont, an orange-spotted bulldog that belonged to the beloved coach, Theo Belmont. Old Clark Field marked the first radio broadcast of a football game with the late General Ike Ashburn as the announcer. By 1933, when the campus looked like this, the university had its athletic tradition well on the way to legend and history. Recognize him? 
That's Clyde Littlefield back in college days. He was the first great college passer and the teacher of university track champions for over a quarter of a century. All Americans are not new at the university. Lewis Jordan was the first Southern player to make Walter Camp's All-American team. You know this man, truly a legend at the 40 Acres. Many are the stories told about Uncle Billy Dish, for whom our own local baseball field is named. A constant parade of baseball champions came under his eye. And this man's eagle eye has followed Uncle Billy's on the UT baseball diamond. He's still in harness and still winning championships for the orange and white. Coach Bib Falk. And this man? Well, this was a few years back. He's quieter spoken now. Three colleges claimed his attention, but he closed his illustrious coaching career in football at the University of Texas. Dana X. Bible. Scholarly, yes, and a gentleman from the old school, a leader and a teacher. Dr. Daniel A. Penick, producer of Intercollegiate Tennis Champions. And, of course, the man of the hour, in just five years becoming a new legend of and for the university, Coach Darrell Royal, the head football coach of the Orange and White, and chosen as the 1961 Coach of the Year by United Press. The legends go elsewhere, too. Austin's legends go around the world. For you will find the Austinite everywhere, from the scholastic world to the fields of battle of the courtroom, from the dry holes of a new oil field to the business world and into the ranks of political leaders in the state and in the nation. And now, the year is ending. Soon the churches will fill with people to hear the good news again, and choirs will raise joyful anthems to the skies. For this is Christmas, a time of joy for man. In the churches will be read the old, old story, and in the homes will come a warmer feeling of love of one another. Now, the choir of St. David's Episcopal Church, directed by Gerald Hamilton, organist choir master. behalf of the Austin National Bank's more than 200 employees, let us take this opportunity to wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Thank you and good night. Progress Report Austin has presented The Legends of Austin, the third in this series of Progress Report Austin reports to you.
Next month, the Austin National Bank invites you to the fourth in this series, Juvenile Delinquency and You. Progress Report Austin is produced by Wynn McLean Associates, directed by Gordon Wilkerson, and is a public service presentation from the Austin National Bank, 517 Congress in Austin, a member of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation.